So yeah, I'm going to, of course, continue talking about the Roaring Twenties. We haven't really finished it all, kind of starting it. And of course, I'll get, I think today I'm mostly getting into talking about the culture, you know, of the Roaring Twenties. And I'll talk about a few other things uh, that happened also uh, in the Roaring Twenties. Anyway, um, let me go ahead and, um, of course, first talk about, you know, what exactly happened um, in the Roaring Twenties. Um, I'll get more like the, the culture part of it in a second. But before I get into that, I do need to talk about, uh, we didn't really get into 1924, uh, what happened in the middle of the um, Roaring Twenties. Now, um, the Roaring Twenties don't really become prosperous until about 1923. It's like when Harding died, uh, where Mayor Warren, Warren G. Harding had, had a heart attack and died. And, um, and so his vice president came in, which was Calvin Coolidge. Uh, he was the 30th president of the United States, originally from Vermont. He later went on to become the governor of, of um of Massachusetts, uh, and um, because he was like this accidental president who came in, and of course he would serve in his own right, with his own term, when he would get reelected, of course, in 1924. He pretty much was like um, Harding. He kind of believed the same kind of isolationist foreign policy. He also favored tax cuts, uh, you see there, and also, um, which we'll get more into later, he believed in like laissez-faire kind of economics uh, overall. So yeah, so that's that's Coolidge, former governor of Massachusetts, and uh, he had become a big hero in the 1930s, even 1920s, um, because of the Boston police strike. He had helped solve the problem with it, and so that's why he ended up becoming vice president, and then of course. Harding died, and he came in uh, after that. So uh, eventually in 1924, Coolidge uh, ran for re-election uh, re uh, at that point. He ran as the um, Republican nominee, uh, and uh, Coolidge, of course, favored, like I said, laissez fair economics. He favored uh, the government shouldn't really um, regulate um the economy, just let it kind of do on its own, uh, basically. And he made a famous, a famous quote that he kind of talked about uh, this laissez-faire kind of economics. He, he said famously about it, he said, the chief business of the American people is business. That's probably his most famous quote uh, he's known for. And so that's pretty much the way the 1920s was, you know, that kind of laissez-faire you know, economics lack of regulations, you know, and things like that. And, of course, some people think later that it it helped the prosperity, but in the end, uh, it also led to the Great Depression, uh, more or less. Oh, by the way, Coolidge had a nickname. He was called Silent Cow. reason why, of course, uh, was he didn't say much. Now, there's a famous story, I think, where he was at a party, and some woman made a bet with him. I don't know how much it was, five dollars, whatever it was. And she said, I bet you I can get you to say more than two words at this party. And of course, the whole party he was quiet, didn't say anything. Before he left the party, he said to the woman, he said, You lose. <laughs> so, didn't say much. Uh, but uh, Cal Calvin Coolidge, 1924, ran against um, a, a the Democrat nominee, he was John W. Davis. He was a corporate lawyer. Also, Robert La Follette got involved. He ran also as well from Wisconsin. He ran for this uh, newly uh, formed progressive party, which was trying to kind of continue progressivism, which had kind of declined at that point uh, in the 20s. And both uh, ran accusing the Republicans of the scandals. They tried to take the Harding scandal and make it a big deal uh, towards Coolidge. But Coolidge, it didn't really touch him because he really basically didn't have anything to do with it about what happened. And so it didn't work. Uh, and so Coolidge ended up winning in a landslide. 
uh, with 382 electoral votes. Uh, by the way, Coolidge had a really good campaign slogan, which was keep cool with Coolidge. Uh, and so after that, Coolidge came in, came president, uh, of course, and pretty much the rest of the 20s, you know, was like a very prosperous period, uh, of course. So let's get into, of course, the main thing we're going to talk about, which is the roaring 20s and, of course, the culture of the 20s. That's really the big thing that dominates, the so-called popular culture, uh, which, of course, uh, came in. Um, why was the 20s so prosperous in American history? Well, got a little slide there for you, but mostly because of the shift between the 19th and the 20th century. You go from the 1800s with the Industrial Revolution really peaking, I guess, at that point. And so you get the mass production of all these different goods, ideas, inventions, and so on that really advance, you know, pretty much uh, modern culture at the time. So uh, they developed the assembly line, which, you know, they able to build things real fast. Uh, automobiles were built, radios, airplanes, whatever else. Uh, was built real fast. Things became real cheap too, you know, because of the oversupply of you know a lot of things that were out there. And of course, one of the most famous things that was built, you know, about this production was in the Roaring Twenties. Was the automobile became mass produced? You can see the top right there. Uh, you've got the so-called Model T, which was developed in production by Henry Ford. He first built the first Model T in 1909. He built only 11,000, by the way, uh, in 1909. Uh, but by 1927, he had built 27 million. I spelled wrong there. He had built 27 million uh, of the Model T. That's amazing. Uh, and, yeah, it had a nickname. It was called the Fent. It should be thin Lizzie. It should be ten Lizzie. Excuse me. Yeah, the ten Lizzie. Uh, and um, I think there's a group called Ten Lizzie, a thin Lizzie you may have heard of, which is an Irish group. That's funny. I'm thinking of ten thin Lizzie. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen that group before. They were pretty good, Ten Lizzie. But uh thin Lizzie, I mean it's like a playoff of it, I guess. Yeah, the ten Lizzie, uh, and it's like a tin can on wheels, uh, and um the old joke about it was you could get it in any color as long as it's black. <laughs> so so anyway, um, so they had the so-called tin, tin Lizzie. Uh, and um, Model T was pretty important. Uh, it was one of the things, like the automobile, was one of the things that really revolutionized um, pretty much American life um, overall. Uh, so Americans were really... Uh, influenced by it, uh, and um, I'll put it right that like that. Women became very independent as well. And I'll get to the flappers later, you know, and all of that. Uh, but women became very independent. There's at least three things that I think in at that time in the early 20th century that made women more independent. One was the automobile, because you know, they could go anywhere, do anything. Uh, of course, uh, the right to vote which started about 1920. Of course, three, birth control. Birth control starts to really, the 1920s, start to be more um, something you see a lot, like the diaphragm, et cetera. Uh, so all those kind of help, you know, women become uh, more independent later. And so you got the flappers that, what you see as a flapper women, I guess you're looking at, uh, with those, the way they dress, short dresses and all that uh, that they wore. All right, let me also talk about some other popular culture. Of course, uh, also, um, so here, here's there's the uh, Model T you're looking at. Uh, also, um, Henry Ford later built the first, um, what they call mo uh, the Model, he built the Model A uh, Ford as well, uh, which was uh, one of the first cars that had a V8 engine in it. Um, so, so Henry Ford was known for developing the first V8 you know, type engine and all that. Uh, of course, we just had a little short video on, um, of course, um, Charles Lindbergh, who I told you was one of the most famous uh, individuals uh, of the 
1920s. Uh, of course, he was known as Lucky Lindy. That's what they dubbed him. Of course, of course, not later with his baby, as you know, you saw in the video. But uh, yeah, he was very, very famous, practically a nobody, like a farm boy that started flying airplanes. Uh, and um, of course, in 1927, he became famous for his transatlantic flight, uh, which took basically less than two days. Uh, and he flew from New York, Manhattan, I guess, well, actually from Long Island, where he started. He crossed, of course, the Atlantic uh, to what is um, Paris, so-called Spirit of St. Louis. Uh, he, of course, helped popularize airplanes. It's one of the things that, of course, it did later. So here's the actual stats they talked about with the um, flight of Lindbergh, but May 20th to 21st, about 33 and a half hours it took him solo flight. Uh, also, let me talk about uh, sports as well, because sports were big in the uh, 1920s. Um, the big sport in uh, America was baseball. Right? Still played today, of course, like Major League Baseball, I guess college baseball. And um, 1920s, of course, Babe Ruth was considered to be the greatest baseball player at that time, Herman Ruth. Uh, and um, he was big. Uh, of course, uh, Babe Ruth uh, was famous for, um, in 1927, hitting 60 home runs, uh, which stayed until record-wise until 1974. Uh, also, another guy that was famous in baseball was, um, and by the way, uh, Ruth played for New York Yankees. Uh, then you have Ty Cobb. He was also very popular, called the Georgia Peach, they dubbed him. He played for the Detroit Tigers. He was probably the second best baseball player uh, behind Babe Ruth. So anyway, talking about baseball uh, and all that. Um, also, uh, another um, big um, sport, if you study about the 1920s, believe it or not, became football. Uh, you see right there. Uh, football and the biggest football player, of course, and the 19. Uh, and by the way, football came about because of rugby. Uh, they believe that um, kind of a combination of rugby, soccer, that kind of thing led to it developing, which mostly developed with the Ivy League schools like Harvard and Yale. Uh, and then other schools got involved too, like Notre Dame. And uh, the greatest coach in the 1920s was Newt Rockney, who had a record of like 80, 90 percent range, 105 victories, 12 losses, and five ties, which the time was pretty good. That's almost as good as Nick Saban, of course, today at Alabama. Uh, so, so that really popularized football. Of course, Notre Dame won a lot of national championships over the years, which they have um, overall. Of course, you're looking at uh, Red Grange there. Red Grange was the greatest football player of the 1920s. It was called the Galloping Ghost uh, because very few people could tackle him. Uh, and um, he played for the University of Illinois, and later he played professional football, of course, with the Chicago Bears. So pretty much in the 1920s, college and NFL football kind of starts at that time. Uh, another uh, guy uh, who became famous, uh, I think I've got a picture of him. Let me see. There he is right there. I'll bring him up. Uh, you have also, you may have heard of Jim Thorpe. I don't even heard of him, but Jim Thorpe was the greatest athlete um, of the 1920s. Uh, he played all kinds of sports, uh, football, uh, baseball, basketball. He was an Olympic, Olympic athlete. He won like gold medals. He was also an Indian. He was Native American. Uh, the so Sock and Fox Nation, I think it was. So it was interesting about that. Uh, first Native American, you know, that was like, like a famous, you know, athlete and, and, and all of that. So so he was, he was sort of the greatest athlete, you know, of the 1920s. Uh, also another uh, great athlete of the 1920s uh, was um, Jack Dempsey. You may have heard of him. Uh, he was also big. They called him the Manassa Mauler. <laughs> uh, and... Um, he said, quote, famously, I said, I can't sing and I can't dance, but I can lick any SOB in the house. That was his famous quote. 
He was also a part Irish, part Cherokee uh, as well. Uh, and um, so, yeah, he was considered one of the greatest, um, you know, boxers, the heavyweight boxer at the time. And it was about heavyweight boxing championship for, champion for like 1919 to 1926. Actually, he was the most, the wealthiest athlete of the 1920s. I think I say he made more money than Babe Ruth did, which is pretty impressive. All right, the other thing I need to talk about, too, that was big in the 20s was um, radio. And that's the thing, of course, if you know about radio. Radio, of course, and record players and all that became real big. Um, I'll put the slide here first if you don't mind. Uh, but it became real popular. Uh, and like radio in the old days, like in the 20s and 30s, was like television. People would actually live, listen to shows like they're watching their favorite TV show. You know, my mom used to tell me about this. Uh, and um, it's all because of the advancements of Guglielmo Marconi. You know, the guy who helped develop radio and all of that. And then over time, what happened was they started developing radio stations. And the first one that did that was called KDKA, which is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's still there. KDKA still exists. Uh, so it's like the oldest radio station in the world. And you can see in 1921, they hired this guy named Harold, Harold W. Arlen, who was the first radio announcer of it. Uh, and he had all kinds of celebrities that would come on the air. Uh, William Jennings Bryan, Will Rogers, Babe Ruth, Herbert Hoover, and all these other people, well, I guess they were famous at the time in the 20s and 30s, uh, et cetera. Uh, also, radio led to like, oh, you also had, of course, record players, like the so called phonograph was big too, uh, as well. And uh, and um, that made like contemporary music real popular, with, of course, jazz music being the most famous type of music uh, that became big uh, in the 1920s. You had the so called one thing they call sometimes the 1920s is the so called jazz age. Uh, that they dub it, uh, which was influenced by a lot of African-American culture uh, in cities like New Orleans and Chicago and New York, uh, et cetera. Uh, they also called it all kinds of names, ragtime, Dixieland jazz. Now, those are all kinds of nicknames uh, that it was dubbed. Um, they also called it Jelly Roll. I don't know if you know that or not. Jelly Roll uh, was another nickname they called it, uh, which was the slang. They say the word jazz, but this is the slang word for sex. Uh, so sex music, I guess, uh, more or less, that they dubbed it. Uh, who are some famous um, jazz musicians of the 1920s? Uh, well, obviously, Louis Armstrong was pretty famous, not just in the 20s, but up through even up to the, I think Louis Armstrong was famous up to like the 1960s. He was around, of course, a long time ago, uh, of course, in New Orleans. You know, at the airport named after him, right? now uh and um like he grew up in extreme poverty learned to play the cornet uh, they called him satchmo uh, as you know so he, he was kind of one of the men that was instru instrumental in really changing you know jazz music uh, uh, over time uh other ones you may have heard of ellie fitzgerald's probably considered the most famous uh jazz musician he was mostly a singer bessie smith Duke Ellington was big. He was one of the top um, jazz musicians. Like his famous song, Take the A-Train, you may have heard of, uh, was pretty big. Cab Calloway, he was around forever. I remember seeing him in the Blues Brothers movie. <laughs> that, guy so, uh, that guy was so old, man. He's been around forever. I think he died a few years ago, but Cab Calloway. Jelly Roll Morton, of course, Count Bassey. Uh, those are all famous jazz musicians the 20s and probably 30s uh, as well. Uh, a lot of them played at nightclubs. Uh, the, you know about the most famous nightclub, of course, in that period, the 20s and 30s, was the Cotton Club, which was located in Harlem, New York City. Uh, and every, every big artist played there. There was a jazz musician. And uh, Cotton Club later was known for later being kind of desegregated. 
somewhat. Um, I think at first it wasn't, but later anybody could go in there pretty much. So I just care talking about jazz music um, and all that. Here's a slide if you want to look at later about Duke Ellington. He, like I said, he was pretty big. Yeah, he wrote over 2,000 pieces in his lifetime. He was, of course, involved, of course, in the of course so-called Harlem Renaissance uh, that was big uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Yeah, the Harlem Renaissance, that was the other thing that happened in the Roaring Twenties uh, that was big. It was this outpouring of um, African-American music, art, and literature uh, that, that started in New York, uh, in like Harlem, and spread to the rest of the country uh, overall. Peaked in the 20s, but went also into the 1930s uh, as a whole. And um, who were some of the famous um, artists that were of the Harlem Renaissance? Langston Hughes, of course, is considered to be really the most famous. He was predominantly a poet. Um, I do got a little short video I could show on him, Langston Hughes, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, James Weldon Johnson was another. Well, he was a writer, uh, poet. He was also a civil rights activist, uh, James Weldon. John Conti Cullen, of course, was a writer, poet um, as well. Uh, I think he wrote books for children. Uh, W.B. Du Bois, you yeah, forget about him. He was also a famous writer, of course, at that time as well. Um, also a college professor. Also part of the NAACP and the civil rights movement, you know, in the early 1900s. But Langston Hughes, I guess, has always been the one that they always talk about uh, the most, uh, which is big. Let me show you a quick short video on him. Langston Hughes is considered a great author because he spoke to uh, for and about uh, black people in America. Poet, novelist, and playwright, Langston Hughes was the leading voice of the Harlem Renaissance. America was changing during the time that Langston Hughes was so popular. Black consciousness was becoming more and more public, more prominent. I think that Langston Hughes was important because he was one of the early figures to show the dignity and the beauty of ordinary black life. He was one of the most visible of the younger black poets, uh, a new generation that described themselves as the new Negro. Uh, they covered new topics, took on new poetic forms, and sought a wider audience, and Langston Hughes was at the forefront of that. James Mercer Langston Hughes was born in Joplin, Missouri on February 1st, 1902. He wrote a lot about being lonely when he was young, and I think that was a tremendous part of the, the product of moving around so much. After graduating high school, Hughes published his first and most famous poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. It is the first poem that celebrates Africa and dignifies the image of Africa in American literature. The Negro Speaks of Rivers was published in a popular black journal, and so he was really rather widely read from the beginning. His poetry and his prose actually had access to everyday people. While studying at Columbia University, Hughes discovered the Harlem art scene, spending hours in jazz and blues clubs, weaving the rhythms of music into his work. Jazz and blues uh, were great influences on Langston Hughes. He sought to capture the energy and vitality of the music in his poetry. He was very familiar with the Harlem nightlife. He knew the musicians, and later in his life he would even collaborate with some of the key figures at that time, such as Duke Ellington. Hughes was a prolific writer and one of the first African-American authors who could support himself through his writing. Langston Hughes wrote plays. He edited anthologies of poets of African descent across the diaspora. He wrote short stories. One of his most famous uh, series of short stories centers around Jesse B. Simple. These are tales told by a resident of Harlem to an aspiring writer who's a stand-in for Langston Hughes. He was one of the more widely published of the young poets of the period. He was also among the better connected. He really worked hard to promote the careers of other young writers in Harlem and also throughout the rest of his life. That's also one of his big legacies. <laughs> 
All right, so a little short little uh, biography, of course, on Langston Hughes. Um, so that was, of course, the Harlem Renaissance, which really went into the 20s, but also in the 1930s uh, as well. All right, also, um, let me also talk about, too, besides the Harlem Renaissance, they had this other thing. Uh, of course, there's a slide here if you want to look at, of course, Langston Hughes and more. Um, they also had the Lost Generation, which kind of happened in the 20s and 30s uh, as well. Uh, the Lost Generation uh, was a um, period where writers, um, like in the 20s after World War I, became disillusioned uh, with American life. A lot of them became expatriates, and they left the country. They went to, like, Paris and other cities. Uh, Ernest Hemingway lived in, like, Spain and uh, in France and places like that, Cuba later. Uh, and um, he led to a bunch of popular novels that were published at that time. Uh, the term was actually coined by Gertrude Stein um, or in the 1920s. And um, most two most famous uh, novelists, I guess, in the 20s was F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, who published in 1925, The Great Gatsby. And that likely epitomized, you know, the 1920s with like the bootlegger and all that. And Great Gatsby was likely some kind of bootlegger type character, uh, of course, that was you know, like a type of, you know, uh, Al Capone. Um, and um, so and then Ernest Hemingway also became pop. He was big in the 20s and 30s, et cetera, afterwards. He wrote several books. Uh, Farewell to Arms, of course, was one of his first books he wrote, which was about World War I. And The Sun Also Rises. I don't know if you ever read that book, but it's about bullfighting in Spain. And he actually popularized bullfighting, et cetera. And he's had all kinds of books. Old Man of the Sea, For Whom the Bell Tolls. I think those are some other big books that Hemingway would be big. Uh, and of course, he later lived in Cuba uh, for many years. So a lot of these a lot of these um, men, lost generation type writers, uh, a lot of them didn't live in the United States. They lived in different different parts of the world. So, yeah, I've got a, a few slides, of course. Of course, there's one if you want to look at, uh, of course, F. Scott Fitzgerald. He died young. That's one of the tragic stories about F. F I think, he, well, I don't know, was he close to 50 when he died? He was really, really young. I know that. Anyway, didn't live long either. He died in 1961. Uh, also as well. Now, they also got the dawn of the what they call the talkies. Now, you've heard much about this, but movies became real popular in the 1920s. Uh, if you know about the first movie was produced by, um, I believe it was done by Thomas Edison, um, which was like the what was it called? The Great Train Robbery or something like that. And so Thomas Edison was one that developed the movie camera. And then after that, Hollywood kind of took off uh, by the 1920s. Uh, originally, the early movies were all silent. Uh, so, you know, no, no sound or anything like that. Uh, and then in the late 20s, they started, you know, adding sound to, um, you know, the movies. And they called those kind of movies, they called it a talkie, talkie movie motion picture. The first one produced was one called The Jazz Singer, you know, which involved Al Jolson. Al Jolson was actually this uh, Jewish vaudeville type actor, uh, and he, he helped produce it and acted in it. So I think Max Steiner composed a lot of it, the score and all that. And uh, so that was the dawn of the talkies, 1930s and the 1940s. Um, also, um, the popular actors, those are the popular actors that were big. Um, Rudolph Valentino, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he was the great, the most popular male actor in the 1920s. Women would swoon over him. They thought he was great, like Brad Pitt or somebody. Uh, and um, when he, he died young, you know about this, when he died, all the women lined up <laughs> to see his casket. That's how you know big it was. Um, and all of that. Uh, also, Charlie Chaplin, you've heard of him, Charlie Chaplin. He was also a very popular actor, too, in the 20s and I think 30s. He's one of those famous for that tramp cat character uh, that's well known uh, as well. Uh, I don't have it in there, but the female um, 
actresses, the ones that were the big actress that was big, um, I'll give you is uh, Mary Mary Pickford was big. I thought I had a slide on her Pickford. Uh, she was big. She was the it girl. They called her. I'll add that one on there for you as well. I don't know why I thought I had that one somewhere. Mary Pickford, she was an actress, the it girl, the girl with the curls. That's what they called her, the girl with the curls. Uh, she was big uh, also as well. So talking about movies and all that, and movies were real popular, like especially up through like the 1930s and 40s, and especially when they had air conditioning and all that in theaters. I remember my dad telling me how he would, he'd like to go to the theater because they had AC and all that. Uh, I guess most people didn't have AC, you know, in the early days in their homes. Uh, of course, I talked about the um, flappers. That's the other thing, of course, I mentioned earlier about, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, as well. Yeah, the flapper uh, was, you know, the big type of uh, cultural phenomenon uh, in the 1920s. Women, of course, you know, cut their hair short. Uh, wore short skirts, they smoked, they drank, uh, they did all kinds of new dances. Uh, all this became like a new, you know, crazy fad, uh, if you want to call it um, a craze. Uh, and they say the name Flapper came from a movie that was produced in 1920 that was called The Flapper. And so hence the name, I was kind of joking about that, that's the thing in the bottom of a toilet. It's called a flapper, <laughs> the seal on the bottom of a toilet. Uh, I mean, if you're seeing that in the tank, but anyway, it's called a flapper. That's kind of a joke. But anyway, that's basically uh, the flappers. And uh, with the rise of popular music, um, the flapper lifestyle was big, a very independent lifestyle. I told you about how they, you know, the automobile helped that, birth control, you know, and so on. And uh, big dances were real popular, like uh, the Charleston and the Foxtrot. Those were the two big dances that were people liked the most. The Charleston, it was big uh, overall. In the 1920s and 30s, it even led to marathon dances where people would dance for hours and for, for money. I know in the Great Depression, it was a big, big thing. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie um, – I think it's called uh, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? That's the name of it. Uh, it's a good movie about that, about marathon dancing. Uh, so overall, you know, in the 1920s, things were not very more, very liberal, very uh, morals were kind of thrown out. They were, you know, took the back seat, so to speak, uh, in the 1920s. But um, all this prosperity, you know, is going to go out the, is going to go out the window. It's not going to last forever, uh, you know. And, of course, you know, the height of the um, 1920s, you know, was pretty much, you know, under Calvin Coolidge, uh, his administration. And they had a roaring 20s, too, like in Europe. I think they kind of went through that same kind of period. I think sometimes in Europe they call it the golden 20s. I think that's another term that they use here uh, as well. So, Right, let me talk about, of course, the end of the 20s. Now, um, 1928, of course, uh, what happened um, was there was a presidential election. Of course, the presidential election of 1928, uh, you had, of course, Herbert Hoover uh, running against, um, let's put this up here. Yeah, Hoover running against uh, this other guy named Al Smith. Uh, Calvin Coolidge decided not to run for re-election. He could have. In theory, he could have run. I mean, There's no amendment for preventing him from doing it, but I guess he just didn't want to, you know, serve more than, you know, eight years, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, the Republicans chose Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover, by the way, was Secretary of Commerce under Calvin Coolidge. He was actually very popular. Uh, the reason why he was popular was because Hoover, after World War I, had helped a lot of people um, with, like, food aid, like getting food to Europe because it was like a shortage of food. It's part of why they developed the, you know, prohibition thing because it was a shortage of food. 
Uh, and so he was uh, Secretary of Commerce. He was involved in doing that. Uh, and so that made him real big. You know, so people and then, of course, on top of that, you know, you got the prosperity of the 1920s and all that. And nobody was thinking that there was going to be a Great Depression, you know, that would occur, uh, et cetera. So um, on the other side, the Democrats chose Al Smith, who was a kind of reform minded governor of New York. Uh, the only problem with Al Smith was that he was Catholic. He was Roman Catholic. This became a major issue in the 1928 election. Uh, maybe not so much today, but, uh, of course, a lot of people, uh, you know, didn't like Catholics because, you, know, you know, majority of the country was Protestant. Uh, you know, the influx of all these immigrants from parts of Europe, of course, it made them unpopular, all of that. So they created all these anti-Catholic slogans against Al Smith uh, to kind of, you know, get people to vote for the Republican side. And so a lot of them were anti or, you know, basically, you know, mostly geared against like Irish and Italians who were, I guess, were the majority of people uh, that were, uh, you know, Catholic. Uh, that's part of why, like later, the uh, like Irish developed, you know, St. Patrick's Day, you know, was big and you know, America, and then, of course, the Italians had their Columbus Day. You know, both those were kind of developed to, you know, put more pride in being, you know, Irish or Italian. That's actually why they developed it, you know, so both those, you know, both those days. Um, and um, they still aren't respected, though, later, <laughs> a lot of people. And I think now not so much, but, you know, for a long time they weren't. Um Oh, and these were the famous slogans that were, of course, were used, uh, that were famous. Uh, one, of course, was a vote for Smith is a vote for the Pope. <laughs> That's a mean one. Um, and then the other, third, the second one, of course, was rum, Romanism, and ruin. Uh, apparently, Al Smith favored getting rid of prohibition, like abolishing it, bringing back alcohol legally. And so he was kind of seen as being pro-alcohol. And so a lot of people were kind of against that, you know. And, and so they used that slogan. in the Romanism part, you know, was, of course, being with, with the Catholic Church and all that. Uh, so alcohol, Catholic Church is going to lead to ruin of the country, you know, all that. So Hoover went into went in a landslide. He would win 444 electoral votes uh, to uh, 87 for Al Smith. So it wasn't even close. Uh, if you look at the map here of the um, what happened in the election, uh, it wasn't it wasn't close. And so you can see there that uh, Al Smith only won like eight states. That's it. So he got beat pretty bad uh, by, of course, Herbert Hoover. Of course, you know uh, they would maybe maybe they regret it later. You know if you think about it, because but then so many months afterwards, of course, the prosperity would be thrown out the window with the Roaring Twenties ending pretty bad um, in October, November, nineteen twenty-nine. So prosperity, of course, later um, is going to collapse. It's one of the things that's of course going to happen. I do have some other slides here if you want to look at it uh, right here. Now, of course, we're going to get into, uh, of course, the big thing that really led to, um, you know, what happened uh, with the end of the Roaring Twenties. You've got the 1920 stock market crash. That's the biggest thing that happened. Uh, and um, a little about Hoover, Herbert Hoover before we get started with that. Hoover... Um, kind of get more into him uh, before I talk about uh, the stock market crash. Hoover was a big believer um, in what is called, what's called rugged individuals. It was something he kind of coined, uh, if you know about this. And he believed that uh, people uh, can succeed without outside help or even from direct help from the government. That was pretty much his belief about it. He was like a self-made man, uh, Herbert Hoover, and so that's what he believed the best way to do it is, you know, on your own, not get too much help from, like, say, government giving you handouts and things like that. 
And so he was just like Calvin Coolidge. He had the same belief that government should encourage business, but not touch it, you know, not regulate it, you know, laissez-faire economics, you know, that should be basically, you know, what, um, like Coolidge had said, uh, basically laissez-faire economics pretty much in Hoover uh, about the roaring 20s and all that. He said that famously that the slogan of progress is changing from the dinner pail to the full garage. And so he pretty much thought that the, you know, roaring 20s in the 1930s would continue uh, thereafter. But within six months after he was inaugurated uh, into office, the country was in a Great Depression, uh, pretty much. So that's the thing, of course, we need to talk about today. One of the last things I'll get into, of course, is how the Great Depression, of course, started. And, of course, like I said, the thing that caused it, of course, was the famous stock market crash of 1929. Uh, and um, stock market crash... Um, Occurred in October of 1929. It happened over a series of days, although they seem to think it started maybe back in September of uh, 1929. Uh, and of course, it would, of course, spawn the Great Depression, which would last around 10 years uh, in the country, and it would spread to the rest of the world. The rest of the world was affected, you know, by the Great Depression uh, overall. Uh, and uh, prior to the Great Depression happening with the stock market crash, uh, a lot of people were putting a lot of money into the, into the stock market. It was a bull market, uh, constant prices rising. People were selling their stock left and right. People were even borrowing money to buy stock. There was cases where people would actually, what they call buy on margin, and they would actually uh, put up 10% and then pay the rest in installments. It's crazy how much they were doing. And so a lot of people were making a lot of money. Uh, but what happened was uh, in October of 1929, there were two really bad days that happened. October 24th, which they call Black Thursday, and also October 29th, which was called Black Tuesday. And in both those two days, something like 30 billion shares of stock were lost. It was just a total crash. Uh, and afterwards, they called it all kinds of nicknames, the Great Crash, the Crash of 29. Uh, and at least 1.5 million investors or more lost all their money, like all of it. Uh, there was even suicides where people killed themselves, shot themselves. Uh, I think in Wall Street, they even had people that jumped out of windows. Uh, it was that bad. Businesses closed, banks closed. And then, of course, on top of that, mass unemployment, of course, followed after that. So thousands lost their jobs um, afterwards. They lost their homes. They lost their farms. Uh, something like $3.2 billion in bank savings were lost. That's awful. 1930, there were 7 million unemployed. 1932, there were 12 million unemployed. Uh, which was, I think, around 25%, which was the peak of the Great Depression. Uh, farm commodities collapsed. Farmers had their land and farms foreclosed on. Uh, I'll get to it later, but they had the Dust Bowl that also happened in the Midwest, which compounded the problems as well and caused a lot of migrants to flee to California. So we had stuff like that uh, that was also going on. Uh, causes of the Great Depression, there's all kinds of, you can just, <laughs> there's like at least 10 of them I think you could talk about if you want, about all the causes that occurred. Uh, anywhere from like the post-war, you know, era of World War I may have caused it, they think, excessive borrowing, high tariffs was another thing. Laissez-faire economic policies, like we talked about that, you know, Coolidge and Hoover were for. Uh, uneven distribution of income in the United States. Some people blame the gold standard because right after they went off the gold standard, uh, influence of supply and demand. They think there was an overproduction of goods, uh, people producing too many crops, uh, not enough money in circulation. So there's all kinds of theories 
you know, on what caused the Great Depression. And I think they still don't know, um, you know, what the causes of what caused the stock market crash and the Depression. Uh, but what they do know is that the Depression would, you know, continue towards like World War II, uh, basically. And it really affected people's lives. Uh, like my parents uh, grew up in the Depression. Uh, they, I think my dad was born in 1935, my mom 37. So they were more or less born at the end of the Great Depression. But they talk about how bad it was and affected people. Uh, and a lot of people didn't have any money, you know, like they do now uh, and things like that. So people think today is bad some, sometimes with, you know, what happened with the coronavirus and it you left people unemployed and all that. But what they experienced was way worse than what we're experiencing now um, overall. So I'll get more into the Great Depression later uh, on, uh, of course, Thursday. I'll talk about the Great Depression uh, and, of course, the New Deal uh, that Franklin D. Roosevelt develops as president of the United States to, of course, alleviate it. Uh, and uh, before I go, I'll, I'll go ahead and review a little bit on some of the material we've covered. That'll probably be it for today. Uh, let me go ahead and, of course, review uh, some of these election, uh, some of these topics we covered before. Uh, 1920s, of course, presidential election of 1920. Uh, that was, of course, Warren G. Harding uh, won the presidential election. Uh, and, of course, he proved to be one of the most corrupt presidents uh, in American history. Um, of course, he was known for his slogan, Return to Normalcy, uh, which got him in power uh, when he beat that other guy named James Cox. Uh, Post-war depression. I told you about that, how the country kind of went through a depression after World War I, which either that or uh, they think it may have been a really bad recession. And, of course, uh, the uh, early um, post-war period of, of America was, uh, of course, had a lot of labor strife. Boston police strike, steel strike, United Mine Workers strike. You had the first Red Scare uh, that you had as well. Uh, so all these were major events that happened kind of at the end of Wilson's administration before Harding came in. Uh, the Reds' first Red Scare, of course, happened about 1918, 1920s, uh, about when it was uh, roughly, when there was a fear of communism taking over the country. Uh, they had the Palmer Raids uh, under Woodrow Wilson, where they arrested people that were considered radical. They imprisoned in some of those people, and some of them were even sent to, um, of course, the Soviet Union as well. Sacco and Vansetti trial, that was a famous trial uh, that happened right afterwards uh, in the 1920s. And that was where these two Italian immigrants who were, uh, they think, anarchists, and they were uh, brought up on uh, charges of... Um, killing somebody and robbing a shoe factory. And they were, some people think they were innocent and were given a sham trial. They also had the Scopes trial, don't forget, uh, where John Scopes was accused of teaching Darwinism in Tennessee. I think that was the big trials that time. 18th Amendment, we talked about that. That created national prohibition, which included the Andrew Volstead Act, which enforced it. I uh, told you about Al Capone. Uh, he was one of many of these bootleggers uh, that, that basically sold illegal alcohol, which were sold in bars that were called speakeasies. We told you about that. Uh, so the term, you know, speakeasy, um, blind pig, blind tiger uh, were quite common. Uh, also, that led to the beginning of the Roaring Twenties. So in a sense, you know, you study about, you know, jazz music and, you know, out, legal alcohol. Those were the, you know, the big things in the, of course, 1920s. Uh, of course, today we talked about popular culture uh, overall, the Roaring Twenties. Told you about Henry Ford, the Model T, one of the first mass-produced automobiles, so-called Tin Lizzie, they called it. Charles Lindbergh, of course famous for his flight across the Atlantic, solo flight, trans flight from New York to Paris in the spare of St. Louis, happened in 1927. I told you about the popularity of baseball. Um, I told you about uh, Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth. Uh, I told you about Jim Thorpe, who was big. Uh, I told you about, uh, who else? Oh, Jim Thorpe. We talked about um, 
Manassa Mauler, wasn't it? Oh, we talked about yeah, Newt Rockney, coach of Notre Dame, Greg Grange, Jim Thorpe. Um, who else did I leave out? Oh, Jack Dempsey. I think we talked about him. Those are all famous athletes, you know, of the 1920s uh, that were big. Radio is big. I told you KDKA was the first radio station found in Pittsburgh. Told you about jazz music uh, like Louis Armstrong, Bessie Smith, Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, uh, Cab Calloway, etc. Those are all famous musicians that were big. Harlem Renaissance, of course, uh, was, uh, of course, a famous uh, African-American art, literature, poetry type movement uh, that started in Harlem, New York in the 1920s and spread to the 1930s. I told you about Langston Hughes, of course, who was the most famous. I showed you a little video on him. Lost Generation, of course, was, um, of course, a, a bunch of uh, American uh, writers that were um, kind of disillusioned about America in World War I. They lived in Europe. Uh, and uh, the most two most famous was F. Scott Fitzgerald, of course, with the Great Gatsby. And, of course, you also had Ernest Hemingway, Farewell to Arms, and, and The Sun Also Rises. I also told you about the popularity of music. Of Cuba movies like the talkie, like the jazz singer was the first motion picture with sound in it. Al Jolson also told you about different um, famous um, um, actors or actresses like uh, Rudolph Valentino, Charlie Chaplin, and he had a toy about Mar Mary Pickford. Those are all big actors and actresses that were big in the 20s. I uh, talked about the Harding scandals you see on the bottom. The Ohio gang was a bunch of politicians and industrial men uh, that were around Harding, and they were accused of corruption. Uh, the teapot, teapot Dome scandal was the biggest scandal uh, under Harding. Uh, that was where the uh, Secretary of Inter Interior, uh, Albert B. Fall, sold um, basically what is federal oil uh, to basically industries. It was earmarked for the U.S. Navy, and they were selling it to people. He was getting money for it. Uh, also, the VA scandal was also big, too, uh, as well. You know, the VA scandal was, we had two that was big. Um, the VA scandal of Charles Forbes was big. And also, uh, Harry Daughtry, who was the attorney general, was also uh, involved in uh, protecting people from the prohibition thing. So I was kind of Mentioned all that before, I think, previously. Uh, we also talked about Calvin Coolidge. He, of course, won in 1924. He was one, uh, of course, who was known as Silent, Ca Silent Cow. Uh, and uh, he had become president because Harding had died in office of, of a heart attack. Uh, and Coolidge became known as, or his slogan, which was keep cool with Coolidge. And Coolidge was known for his laissez-faire type policies on economics, which some people think led to the Roaring Twenties. And he was known for that famous quote you see there, the chief business of the American people is business. Uh, then the 1928 election, we talked about that too. Herbert Hoover, Republican, uh, who was the Secretary of Commerce, defeated Alfred E. Smith, governor of New York. Remember, Smith lost mostly because he was a Catholic. Uh, and they used a bunch of nasty slogans against him, like that one called Rum, Romanism, Ruin. Hoover was the one known for his type of philosophy about life and success, which he called it rugged individualism. Uh, the last thing I talked about, of course, was the fact that the Roaring Twenties collapsed at the end of 1929 with the stock market crash, October 1929. It was called all kinds of nicknames, the Great Crash the crash of 29. And I told you that the cause of the Great Depression with the stock market crash was caused by numerous things, like at least 10 of them, you know, or something like that or more. So they're not, they're still not sure uh, what caused it. Uh, but um, the Roaring Twenties were a very interesting time uh, in American history. And so, like I said, I'm going to move on later, you know, to talk about um, the 1930s. We'll get more into that with the Great Depression. And of course, I'm going to talk mostly about the New Deal, uh, which, uh, of course, Franklin, Franklin D. Roosevelt, of course, 
uh, develops. Uh, and uh, I'll talk, I am going to talk about first the beginning of Hoover's administration, which is kind of, he's made fun of a lot. Uh, if you know about that, uh, Hooverisms, they called it, I guess, later. Uh, and so I'll get into that later. But before I go, don't forget to uh, remind you uh, that um, that Canvas quiz on, um, I think it's on the Teddy Roosevelt Taft Wilson era is still up. Uh, so don't forget about that. Try to get that done. I'll leave it open until Thursday for you to finish. And then uh, also, um, I am going to have a new Canvas quiz, of course, up on uh, Thursday, which is on the World War I era lectures. That's going to be coming up. And I'll talk later. Hopefully, maybe next week, we might be able to start talking about, you know, having a second exam coming up. So that's it for today. Y'all take care. Hope y'all having a good week and all that. I'll see you later.